All right, part two of review. So uh, how is a personality disorder different from other types of disorders like mood or anxiety disorders? Remember this one? Personality disorders. They're, they're distinct um, because they tend to be quite stable, long-term, chronic. They're, some psychologists even see them as kind of extreme uh, personality traits. So we have narcissistic personality disorder, which is a sort of a lifelong... Pr people who suffer from this disorder have show a pattern for most of their lives of being um, overly focused on themselves and, and their own needs to have an inflated on the surface, an inflated sense of self. In fact, people with narcissistic personality disorders suffer from low self-esteem. But they're, they're, they're people who need attention, who need other people to focus on them. That's an example of a personality disorder. In the disorder we focused on uh, mainly um, was antisocial personality disorder. So, so how, how are personality disorders different from disorders like mood or anxiety disorders? Well, I'll, I'll use major depressive disorder as an example. Uh, remember we talked about episodes of depressive episodes, people cycling in and out. Um, so, so, you know, we may experience depression for several weeks and then it may go away. Whereas with a personality disorder, it's something we live with typically for the rest of our lives. And personality disorders tend to be quite resistant to, to therapy. Uh, describe some of the qualities of the so-called psychopath. How is psychopathy diagnosed? Okay, well, why don't we uh, answer the second part first? Uh, it'll lead into a description of the symptoms. So, do you remember the person who um, uh, is known to be sort of the world-leading expert on psychopathy? Do you remember his name? Um, I've still got a fair bit of it. His name is Bob Hare. It's spelt differently. Um, but uh, Bob Hare was a, and still is, I think, an instructor at UBC. Did a lot of research in the prison system. And he developed a tool, actually an interview protocol, for diagnosing psychopathy. Remember what it was called? It, it, it's in your PowerPoint lecture notes. Uh, it's called the PCL, Psychopathy Checklist. And it's a series of questions um, that the clinician asks the individual in an interview. And it's typically psychopathy, <laughs> well, uh, can't, uh, we don't have a paper and pencil self-report tool to diagnose psychopathy uh, because most one of the features of psychopathy is deceit. So somebody with psychopathy is probably gonna, not going to answer these questions seriously. In an interview, you can probe and you can explore the person's background and history. Um, so what are some of the uh, qualities of the psychopath? Um, so we talked about things like uh, lack of empathy, uh, sort of a shallow sense of uh, experiencing emotions, um, a, a, a glibness, a superficialness, a, 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 a person who's quite charming, at least on the, on the surface. Um, a lack of remorse or guilt. They can do horrible things and, and not feel badly about them. In fact, may s seem confused about why other people are pointing out how horrific their behavior has been because they just don't see it that way. Uh, impulsivity, irresponsibility, pathological lying, grandiose sense of self-worth within the antisocial personality disorder is narcissistic personality disorder. It's a part of, it's a feature of uh, psychopathy. Um, okay, so we're going to transition here into some questions on therapy. How did Freud approach therapy? Contrast this with the humanistic approach. Kind of like night and day, huh? So reflect on some of the assumptions of 
psychoanalytic or Freudian psychotherapy and humanistic. Well, where do you need to go in Freudian psychotherapy in order to um, uh, be therapeutic? The unconscious. Where do you go in humanistic psychotherapy? Carl Rogers, Fritz Perls, the conscious mind. Very different point of intervention. A Freudian therapist would probably describe uh, the individual they're treating as a patient. A uh, humanistic therapist would likely describe them as a client. A psychoanalytic or Freudian therapist is the expert. The Rogerian or person-centered therapist sees the client as the expert, as the vehicle for change. With a Freudian uh, approach, uh, the therapist interprets and diagnoses, well, in, 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 in interprets uh, in order to uncover the unconscious conflicts. Um, so he, he or she is the expert. With the humanistic therapist, they're using those three relationship qualities, the genuineness, the or congruence, the unconditional positive regard, the empathy to, to help um, guide the client towards his or her own conclusions. Um, what three qualities did Rogers believe are essential for a therapeutic growth to occur? Well, we've just talked about them. Um, it's not a very well-worded question. Um, what three qualities did Rogers believe are sufficient for a therapeutic growth to occur? He believed that if the, if the therapist demonstrates a, a true empathetic, deep understanding of the client, if the therapist is real or authentic or genuine or congruent, however you want to call it, and if the therapist values the client unconditionally, not always accepting his or her behavior, but values the client, those three things are enough for therapy to be effective. And that actually has been a critique of humanistic therapy, that humanistic therapists are too, well, it's an okay therapy to help people deal with life transition issues, feelings of loss, job transition, relationship issues, but it, it, it's not sufficiently rich to help people through um, uh, depression or anxiety. Rogers would push back on that and say, yes, it is, I think. Um, Fritz Perls. Okay, if you haven't already done so, you have to watch Perls in action. He's the kind of the chubby German guy, the chain-smoking guy who works with uh, Gloria. Um, Fritz Perls focused on helping his clients increase their, I got a couple of blanks there. What does he, what does he focus on in the therapy? What is he, what is he, what is he most concerned with? Is he, is he get the client to talk about his or her childhood and the past in depth or what they'd like to do in the future or what they're upset about? Is that where he focuses his attention? No, the focus is on increasing the client's awareness and specifically the client's awareness of the here and now. So watch that video, maybe again, if you, if you uh, and, and, and notice how much of what Pearls is doing is forcing Gloria to really confront the validity of what she's saying and what her body language is doing in the here and now. That stuff is what Pearls believed was true or authentic. Um, Albert Ellis cha uh, challenged his clients to think differently. Why? Who was Albert Ellis? He is featured in the last video. Uh, what was Ellis's approach? Well, Albert Ellis uh, pioneered rational emotive therapy, RET. So he was a cognitive therapist. And, and he believed the way to help people was to change how they think, to challenge their irrational assumptions. Um, one of the worksheets I posted for you in the PowerPoint from that lecture um, takes you through something called cognitive restructuring. And it's based on Ellis's early work, that, that this notion that you need to help the client 
understand that it, it, it's possible that how they're viewing the world just isn't realistic. Um, Seligman, although he wasn't a cognitive therapist, um, he was, remember he was part of the positive psychology movement, um, his model would align with Ellis in that Seligman said, look, you know, people get themselves into trouble, specifically develop depression um, because they make internal, stable, and global attributions. Remember that model? So I'm internal. It's me. I screwed up. I'm the bad person. Stable. I'm always going to screw up. I'm always going to be the bad person. Global. I screw everything up. <laughs> and I'm going to do it for the rest of my life. Um, Seligman argued that if we think that way, that's a recipe for depression. Um, give one example of behavior therapy. What types of disorders is behavior therapy particularly good for? An example of behavior therapy, well, the one from our lecture is, um, remember, it's got a long name, systematic desensitization. Uh, and it's comprised of two things, helping the client construct an anxiety hierarchy and then training the client to use progressive relaxation. Um, another common therapy is called flooding. I remember uh, in graduate school that I had a colleague <clears throat> who was training to be a clinical psychologist and she used flooding with one of her clients who had an extreme fear of dirt. Flooding is a, again, flooding is a type of behavior therapy and behavior therapy um, is focused on getting the client to change his or her behavior. So this person avoided um, dirt, uh, which would significantly impact your functioning. Um, maybe we're heading back in that direction now as a, as a world. Uh, anyway, so this flooding is a behavioral technique that um, is not gradual at all, and it forces the client to confront um, his or her, the, the thing that they fear in, in, in a, most flooding would suggest, in a very immersive, intense kind of way. And this, and this one client, um, this colleague of mine, actually had the client, using flooding, had the client on her hands and knees touching the, touching the, uh, 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 a toilet, right? That'd be a little horrific for most of us, especially if it hadn't been washed in a while. Um, but, um, yeah, that, that's an example of flooding. Another example of flooding would be somebody with, a, with, a, with a, uh, a snake phobia, putting them in amongst snakes. And the idea is you flood them, you immerse them in that situation, and people ultimately come to realize, okay, I'm still alive, I'm all right, nothing bad happened, scared the crap out of me, but I'm okay. Okay, maybe I can, maybe, Maybe I don't need to be as afraid of these, as afraid of these things as I am. So you probably are thinking, wow, that flooding thing, that, that sounds risky to me, and, and it is. And that's not, and, and so it's up to the clinician to use his or her judgment as to whether that's appropriate or not. Usually behavior therapy is, and, and working through phobias is done more uh, gradually. What type of, what types of disorders is behavior therapy particularly good for? What is it good for? Do you know? Phobias, okay? Remember learned? Things that are learned can be unlearned. Behavior therapy, it can help people unlearn the association they have with the thing that they, that they fear. Um, what is CBT and how is it different from behavior therapy? You know what CBT stands for? That'll take you a long way to understanding how it's different from behavior therapy. BT stands for behavior therapy. C stands for cognitive, so cognitive behavior therapy. So yes, it's a combination of cognitive and behavior therapy. So it, 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 interventions designed to help people change how they think and how they behave. Um, so that's how it's different from behavior therapy. A uh, couple more questions and then we'll uh, put a pause on and uh, I'll do the next video on social uh, psych issues. Evidence-based practice, I think I already commented on it earlier in this, in this video, 
it is um, show us the money. You know, uh, therapists should be guided by therapy that has demonstrated effectiveness. So researchers need to do research on what type of therapy is most effective for what type of disorder. And then the clinicians who are actually doing the therapy, well, they need to be aware of that research and listen to it and use best practices in their work. Um, what does the research on therapeutic effectiveness indicate? Well, thank goodness it indicates it works. <laughs> About 80% of people in therapy are better off than uh, comparison groups of people who don't do therapy. Therapy also tends to speed up um, uh, the resolution of, of symptoms and it tends to decrease the likelihood of, of relapse. Finally, what is an SSRI? Well, thank goodness I get to mention toilets twice in this video. And so I've mentioned them in connection with flooding. I also, I think, use the analogy of a flush uh, in terms of SSRIs. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. They're a chemical in, in the brain. And what, uh, well, serotonin is a chemical in the brain. And what SSRIs do, it, it doesn't increase the amount of serotonin. What it does is it keeps the serotonin in the synapse for a longer period of time. So it, it keeps the flush going. The water keeps swirling in the bowl. Oh God, I, maybe I should back off this analogy, but it, 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 it keeps the serotonin in the synapse. So it, it's like your brain is getting more access to serotonin. Okie dokie, let's push pause. And when I, uh, the, the last third of this uh, review session will be on social psych.